Our first presentation will be uh, delivered by uh, video by Huda Hadri. Hello everyone, my name is Hoda and I'm going to talk about economic models of equality of opportunity and their connections to fairness for machine learning. Automated decision-making systems are everywhere and their decisions can be unfair. This realization has motivated an active area of research into quantifying and guaranteeing fairness for machine learning. To make predictive models fair, the first step is to formally define what it means for a model to be fair. Fairness is a controversial concept, so as you might expect, many different mathematical formulations of it have already been proposed. Existing notions of group fairness, which is the focus of this work, require a certain metric quantifying benefit or harm to be equal across socially salient groups. For instance, equality of odds considered, uh, considers a classifier fair if it distributes various types of error, i.e. false positive and false negative rates, equally across different groups. When it comes to these formulations of fairness, unfortunately, we cannot have it all. FairML has already established the existence of trade-offs among various notions of fairness. Importantly, it has been shown that satisfying multiple fairness criteria at the same time is impossible. Now the question is, how should we deal with these findings? Instead of requiring multiple fairness criteria to partially hold at the same time, we focus on selecting the right notion of fairness given the societal context in which the model is to be deployed. To put it differently, we address the normative question of when should we use each notion of fairness? We do this by mapping the recently proposed notions of algorithmic fairness to economic models of equality of opportunity. This offers a unifying framework for viewing the existing notions of fairness, and importantly, it allows us to explicitly spell out the moral assumptions underlying each one of them. In addition, this approach confers a moral meaning to the impossibility results that I just told you about. Okay, with that upshot in mind, let's get started. Quick note that I will be focusing throughout on supervised learning and I will use the standard notation, although I don't really expect you to closely follow the notation and math. I'm just leaving them on for the computer scientists in the audience. Let me begin with a little bit of background about equality of opportunity or EOP. EOP is a widely supported ideal of fairness in political philosophy. Unlike equality of outcomes, EOP makes a distinction between morally acceptable and unacceptable inequality. The idea at the heart of equality of opportunity is to emphasize the importance of factors for which people can be held accountable and minimize the impact of circumstances and arbitrary factors. These are factors for which people cannot be held responsible. Economists have proposed several models for EOP. At a high level, these models assume that an individual's outcome is affected by two main factors, his or her circumstance C and his or her effort E. Circumstance or type C is meant to capture all factors for which the individual should not be held morally accountable. For instance, in the context of employment decisions, we may consider gender as circumstance. Effort E captures all accountability factors, those that can morally justify inequality. In our example, we may consider years of education as effort. I should emphasize that economic literature refers to E as effort for the sake of concreteness and brevity, but E is meant to summarize all accountability factors, those that are viewed as legitimate sources of inequality. For any circumstance C and any effort level E, a policy phi induces a distribution of utility or well-being among people of circumstance C and effort E. In our example, we may consider wage to reflect the utility. An EOP policy will ensure that an individual's utility will be to the extent possible only a function of their effort and not their circumstances. Next, I will tell you about two variants of EOP, one called Rawlsian EOP and the other one Lucky Egalitarian EOP. As we will shortly see, the difference between these two is in how they treat E. Rawlsian EOP assumes E is interpersonally comparable, and in particular, it assumes that the level of E is not affected by circumstance C or implemented policy phi. It then requires that for individuals with similar effort level E, the distribution of utility is the same regardless of circumstance. Going back to our employment example, suppose we have four applicants, Alice and Bob, 
let's say they both have five years of education, and Anna and Ben, who have three and seven years of education respectively. Rosie and EOP would require Alice and Bob to have the same wage prospects because they have similar years of education. Unlike Rousey and EOP, Luck Egalitarian EOP offers a relative view of effort and allows for the possibility of the circumstance C and implemented policy phi impacting the distribution of effort. In this setting, Romer, an economist who has extensively worked on formalizing Luck Egalitarian EOP, argues that in comparing efforts of individuals with different circumstances, we should somehow adjust for the fact that those efforts are drawn from distributions that are fundamentally different. As a solution, he goes on to propose measuring a person's effort level by his rank in the effort distribution as of his type rather than by the absolute level of effort he expends. Lucky egalitarian EOP requires that people sitting at the same quantile or rank of the effort distribution for their corresponding type all have the same distribution of utility regardless of circumstances. In our employment example, Lucky egalitarian EOP suggests that we should look at everyone's rank in terms of years of education among applicants of their own gender. Among females, for example, Alice is ranked first and Anna is ranked second. Also among males, Bob is ranked second and Ben is ranked first. A lucky egalitarian EOP po uh, policy would, re it would ensure that Alice and Ben have the same wage prospects and may indeed assign Bob to a less desirable position than Alice, even though they have similar years of education. The key idea here is that being a female has likely played a negative role in Alice's chance of getting more years of education. So the EOP policy should make up for this. Now let's draw a formal connection between the recently proposed notions of group fairness for supervised learning and economic models of EOP. Observe that in practice, predictive models inevitably make mistakes. Sometimes these mistakes are beneficial to the subject and sometimes they cause harm. We posit that in this context, EOP would require individuals who are similar in terms of what they can be held accountable for to have the same prospect of receiving this advantage or disadvantage, and this should be irrespective of their irrelevant characteristics. We distinguish between an individual's actual and effort-based utility subsequent to being subjected to algorithmic decision-making. We define an individual's advantage or total utility U as the difference between their actual and effort-based utility. Our main conceptual contribution is to map the supervised learning setting to economic models of EOP by treating predictive models as policies, irrelevant features as circumstance, and effort-based utilities as effort. Our work offers a moral framework for determining the appropriate notion of fairness in a specific context. With the application domain in mind, we need to decide what factors should be considered accountability. How can they be summarized into scalar? And what is a suitable notion of utility for decision subjects? Once we answer these questions, we can define the appropriate notion of fairness with an EOP rationale tailored to the societal context in question. We argue that answering such questions is outside the expertise of computer scientists alone and ideally has to be resolved through the appropriate process with input from stakeholders, domain experts, and social scientists. With our framework, we can explicitly spell out the moral assumptions underlying existing notions of fairness for binary classifications by viewing them as special cases of EOP. For instance, equality of odds can be thought of as an instance of Rawlsian EOP, which implicitly assumes that the true label appropriately summarizes what a decision subject can be held accountable for. Similarly, predictive value parity is an instance of lucky egalitarian EOP, and it assumes that the predicted label or risk reflects an individual's effort-based utility. Our framework also allows us to interpret recent fairness and possibility results in a new light. As I just mentioned, different notions of fairness make very different assumptions about which subset of decision subjects deserve the same outcome. And depending on the context, usually only one, if any, of these assumptions is morally acceptable. We argue, therefore, that unless we are in highly special cases, it is often unnecessary from a moral standpoint to ask for multiple fairness notions to be satisfied simultaneously. 
For further details and the discussion of several real-world scenarios, please have a look at our paper. Thank you. Our next presenter, our next presenter is uh, Juba Ziani. Hey everyone, I'm Juba. I'm a PhD student at Caltech, um, and this paper is joint work with Nikolai Morlik and Katrin Oligat. So, um, as we all know, personal data drives a lot of the important decisions that are being made about individuals. You can think, for example, of bail decisions, loan approvals, and many other such examples. And we know that often uh, bias is being introduced in those decisions. And many such sources of bias have been identified. It could be that data is going to be more noisy or less plentiful when it's about a disadvantaged population. It could be the decision maker himself is going to be biased. It could be that you're going to be using a uh, machine learning algorithm that's going to mimic past bias. And there could be many other reasons uh, why there's going to be disparities between populations. In this talk, what we want to do is to study disparities in access to population level, population level signaling as a source of bias and inequalities. So there's been a lot of work in economics on um, information uh, asymmetries, signaling, and the power of information confers. In particular, in 2010, uh, Kamenik and Gensko introduced a um, very widely studied uh, model of patient persuasion, and this is the model we're going to focus on in this paper. So what is signaling? So imagine you have the following situation. On the one hand, you have individuals in population. On the other hand, you have a decision maker that must make decisions about the individuals in that population. And then in the middle, you have the signaler. What the signaler is going to do is the signaler is going to see information and data about the individuals in the population and is going to select one information and filter how much information to show the decision maker about these individuals. And the, signal, the signaler may do so in a way that's going to be used to advocate for a population. If I take the setting of university admissions, I'm going to say that our decision maker here is a university that must decide which students to admit. The individuals are the students in high school, and the signaler is going to be the high school the students are in. The high school can do something like maybe inflating grades, maybe suppressing rankings, maybe exaggerating recommendation letters, so that it's going to get more students admitted into the university. More formally, what the signaler is doing is the signaler is going to commit to what we call a signaling scheme. The signaling scheme is going to be a randomized mapping of the information that he has about, it's about the individuals and sending the information that the school has about the students to signals that are going to be revealed to the decision maker here at the university. And the decision maker is going to only observe the signals and must choose whether to admit or not admit the student based on that um, signal. So the way he's going to do so is through base updates. So the decision maker is going to compute how likely it is that the student is qualified given the signal and the information that he's seeing about his student and use that to make decisions. So here is the model we're going to look at today. We're going to stay in this uh, college admission setting. On the one hand, we have the students. We're going to assume that the students have one of two possible types. A student is either a good student or a bad student. So the type is just a measure of the qualification level of that student. On the other hand, uh, we have a university, and the university wants to admit as many of the good students as possible and reject the bad students. And then in the middle, we have the high school. The high school, as I said before, is going to see some information about the students, but it's not going to be able to see the students' types. The high school is going to observe information about the students in the form of grades. And those grades are going to be noisy, imperfect estimates of the students' true types or qualification level. 
and then the school is going to signal to the university. So remember that the point of this paper is to look at disparities in access to signaling as a source of inequality. To do so, we're going to look at two extreme cases of how the school could be signaling. Uh, the first one is going to be that of a revealing school, and the second one is going to be that of a strategic school. So what we call a revealing school is a school in that basically does the most naive thing and just truthfully reveals to the university all of the information that it has about its students. So basically here, their transcript is just going to reveal the students' grades. On the other hand, the strategic school is going to try to do something smarter, and they're going to try to design the signal or their transcripts so as to maximize the number of students that are going to be admitted to the university. So unsurprisingly, a school that is strategic in its signaling is going to be able to get more students admitted than a revealing school. How many more students? Well, we can show in the setting that you, the strategic school can get up to twice as many students admitted. So there is quite a disparity here in how the schools are going to be able to place their students to universities. And another interesting observation that we have is that as the accuracy of the grade, of the grading scheme of the school is going to increase, so as those grades become better and less noisy reflection of the student's abilities and qualifications, um, the strategic school is going to start doing better and better and get more students admitted. But on the other hand, and per perhaps surprisingly, a revealing school is going to start doing worse and worse and get fewer and fewer of their students admitted. So as you're improving your grading scheme, the disparities between the disparities due to signaling are going to increase. Next, uh, we want to look at the effect of a classical intervention on unfairness due to disparities in the abilities to signal. The intervention we're going to look at is just asking students to take the SAT and reporting that score to the university. We show that per perhaps, not surprisingly, if your SAT score is going to be accurate enough, this score is going to have the effect of reducing the inequalities between a revealing and a strategic school. And the figure that I have right here plots the unfairness between a revealing and a strategic school as a function of the accuracy of the grade at a fixed accuracy of the SAT score. And the blue line, the blue curve, is the uh, a measure of the unfairness in the um, absence of an SAT score. The orange line is uh, a measure of unfairness in the presence of an SAT score. And we can see that the blue line is well over the orange line in most cases, meaning that the unfairness is much worse when there is no SAT score. What's surprising, however, and what's pretty bad news, is that if your SAT score becomes inaccurate enough, it can have the opposite effect of actually increasing the disparities between a revealing and a strategic school that are due to uh, signaling. And so if you look at the figures uh, that I have right here, you can see that as the um, SAT accuracy is going to become worse and worse, the orange curve is going to overtake more and more of the blue curve, meaning that like for more values of the parameter of the great accuracy, uh, the presence of an SAT score is actually going to increase the unfairness between a revealing and a strategic, strategic school. Um, so let me close out on a bunch of uh, future directions that we have. Uh, so one thing we want to do next is we want to enrich um, our SAT model to include disparities between possibly advantageous, possibly disadvantaged populations. Um, so it could be that some populations are going to be better prepared than others are at taking uh, this kind of test and we're not modeling this right now and would like to model this in future work and understand how much this is going to affect, further affect disparities between uh, schools. And uh, the last direction that we want to look at is what's happening if the university is capacity restricted. So in the model that we have right now, the university is willing to accept an infinite number of students if the university likes the students in practice. In practice, uh, the university is going to have a capacity. This capacity is going to affect how admi admission decisions are going to be made. 
And this is in turn going to affect fairness between a revealing and a strategic school. And we would like to understand this better in future work. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you. And the, the next speaker is Inbal Talgman Cohen. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Inbal. Can you hear me? Um, okay, so um, I'm a computer scientist uh, with a legal background, and uh, I want to tell you today about how economic equilibrium can help us uh, when we're trying to achieve fairness and transparency in resource allocation. So a resource allocation decision determines who gets what, and if we want it to be fair, uh, we want to take into account uh, both who wants what, uh, preferences of the people over the resources that we're allocating, and second, who's entitled to what. And uh, these uh, uh, decisions on resource allocation are increasingly made by algorit algorithmic systems. You can think of these large uh, electronic marketplaces, uh, decisions like credit scoring, ranking, you know, who gets more attention, and so on. So the scenario I want to focus on today is the following. I have two players. Uh, you can think of food banks that are catering to populations with different needs. And then I have the resources that I want to allocate, um, for example, donated food items. And the first thing to notice here is that in this scenario, using money for the allocation is inappropriate. Okay, it's against the idea of the donation. And as we said, to allocate the resources, we want to look at preferences and entitlements. So the entitlement here could be, for example, let's look at the first food bank. So how many mouths uh, does this uh, food bank feed? Maybe 3K. Uh, and then the preferences are roughly additive, by which I mean that if they get a truckload of beans, they value it 100. Truckload of cereal, they value it 80. If they get both, they value it at 180. Okay, this is all kind of scale free because we're in a world without money. And then the second food bank has its own entitlement, okay, and its own uh, preferences. And the question here is, what constitutes a fair allocation of the items among uh, the food banks? And this kind of scenario comes up in um, you know, other applications, uh, uh, allocating uh, courses to students, uh, shifts to workers, and basically any kind of allocation where you want to fairly allocate, but you can't, or it's inappropriate to use money. Okay, so this is a fundamental question. Uh, what do we know about it? So there's a very basic uh, notion of fairness uh, called fair share. Um, the, uh, let, let's look at the following uh, well-known procedure uh, for dividing a cake fairly between two kids. Uh, the first kid divides the cake, cuts it into two pieces, and then the second kid picks his favorite piece. Uh, and uh, this is intuitively fair, and the reason is that uh, both players are getting their fair share. Okay? The, the first player, for example, is getting at least half of her or is getting at least half of her value uh, for the entire cake because the way that she, the way that she cuts the cake is she's going to divide it exactly into two pieces that she views as, as equal, and then the second is doing just as well because she goes first. Um, so this is great, uh, but the problem is that this fairness notion is a bit too strong for us. Okay, we're not dividing a cake where you can cut anywhere you want. We're looking at indivisible items. Okay, we have a truckload of uh, food that's donated. So if KFC uh, denotes a truckload of food, then the truck will go to one food bank. And you know, this is just kind of, it's inf infeasible to share here. So we're gonna seek as fair an allocation as possible given that we're looking at indivisible items. Okay, so let's modify our procedure so that, that it applies to indivisible items. And this time, the first, cake is taking the, the first kid sorry, is taking the indivisible items and dividing them into two piles. And then the second kid is picking their favorite pile. And uh, now, uh, this uh, procedure will um, guarantee something called max min share. Okay, this is as close to half of your value for the total um, resources allocated as possible, okay? Because the first kid will make these two piles as you know, equal in his eyes or in her eyes as possible, okay? Maybe it's not exactly equal because of the indivisibilities. And um, this is kind of you know, exactly what you would want if you're allocating indivisibilities and, uh, or indivisibles and you're behind a thin veil of ignorance. Okay, you know your own preferences, but you don't know what other people's preferences will be. I argue that this is the kind of procedure that you would consider fair. Okay, so this is a great place to kind of remind you of what economic equilibrium um, is. So it's the idea that in a market, uh, market forces will drive prices to, uh, to clear the market, basically to have supply equal demand. 
Again, the equilibrium prices are, are just right, okay? They're not, they're sufficiently high so that, you know, not everybody wants to buy everything on the market. You don't have over demand. And then they're sufficiently low so that the market clears, okay? We don't have waste. To, you don't have these items on the market that are priced too high and nobody wants them. And um, even though we're in a setting without money, <clears throat> This is actually applicable to us, okay? Because you can just use fake money. And this is really um, very similar to what's actually being used to allocate uh, food donations to food banks in the US. So here's how it works. A food bank will get a budget, let's say 10K points, uh, representing their entitlement. And then uh, you have these equilibrium uh, item prices. And each food bank will take their budget and they will look at all the, the priced uh, food items and they will pick the, the set of items that they can afford and is best you know, the best affordable set of items for them, and then also the market clears, so we don't waste, waste any food. And it turns out that this, um, this concept for economics has amazing fairness properties, okay? You can show that each player will, is guaranteed to get at least her maximum share, and also it has this built-in transparency, right? Because everybody comes to the market, they face the same prices, uh, they can just pick what they want, and uh, so it's a very, very, very level playing field. And it's kind of almost too good to be true, and it is too good to be true. So here's a, an example of a really simple market where you just don't have equilibrium. Um, let's say we have one uh, f uh, item, okay, one uh, truckload of cereal, and we have two food banks that have the same uh, budget, 10K. If you price this uh, item above 10K, well, the market doesn't clear, okay? Nobody has enough money to buy it. And if you price it at or below 10K, then both will want to buy it and you have over demand. And there's no way you can price here so that you get an equilibrium. The reason why uh, we're still kind of optimistic um, about this solution concept is that uh, really the issue here is the equal budgets. And we, we kind of view this as a knife's edge uh, case, uh, which hopefully will disappear once the entitlements, uh, the budgets representing the entitlements are slightly different, which is usually what happens in practice, right? Um, in a lot of scenarios, uh, the peop people are, are a little bit different in their entitlements. So in our example, this indeed solves the problem. Okay? If the first food bank has slightly higher uh, budget, then um, you can set the price to be uh, you know, this, this slightly higher budget, and then uh, you get an equilibrium. And what we show in the paper is that um, more generally, you know, in markets, not just with one item, but with a lot of different items and you know, different uh, preferences and so on, then you get equilibrium existence once you have slightly different budgets. Okay, we formalize this as a theorem. Uh, we talk about budgets that you add you know, very, very small perturbations to. And we have some other existence theorems uh, in the paper which are like this. Okay. <clears throat> um, so um, now that we have this, um, uh, now that we've slightly perturbed the budgets to get equilibrium existence, this raises a new question. And that is um, that uh, fairness, will fairness still hold? And uh, I want to say that intuitively, uh, once you have the players and they all kind of have the same budgets, um, intuitively fairness will hold approximately, which is you know, what we were aiming for because we're de dealing with indivisibilities, and I'll um, show this on my next slide, which, which is the last one. Um, and then while we're at it, you know, why, why won't we, don't we even look at budgets that are really different from one another? Okay? Food banks could be catering to populations of very different sizes. And um, the question is, what constitutes a fair allocation of indivisibles among unequals? And this is an interesting question that, that is understudied uh, in, the the in theory. Okay, so um, what's interesting is that once you look at this concept of equilibrium from economics, you actually can pinpoint the right fairness notion for allocation, and we get theorems of this, point, of this uh, kind. Um, so, in any equilibrium allocation, among players with possibly very different budgets, uh, each player is going to get something uh, we call proportional maximum share, um, which is a generalization of maximum share, and it's, um, and I'm going to demonstrate it through an example, okay, or as close as possible, giving the indivisibilities. Um, so here's here's our example. Uh, we have food banks that uh, are very different in entitlement. The, the first food bank is catering uh, to 30% of the population. So what's intuitively fair is let the first one divide uh, the items into 10 piles and let the second one, one pick seven piles. Okay, and this will um, ensure, uh, this will ensure that the first will get uh, what we call the proportional maximum share or as close to 30% of the resources uh, in their view. Okay, we actually let the first player have a little more power, okay, they can uh, divide it maybe into four items and let the other one uh, choose three uh, if that works better. Okay, let me wrap up. 
Um, so um, one uh, kind of high-level takeaway uh, of this paper is that markets, prices, and equilibrium are useful tools uh, when you try to define and implement fairness alongside the usual suspects of machine learning and so on. Uh, we've seen that equilibrium can help define fairness uh, for example, in the context of indivisible, indivisibles among unequals, which was understudied. And then also that the existence of approximate fair allocations uh, can follow from equilibrium existence once you uh, add these uh, small perturbations to the budgets. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, our last speaker for the session is uh, Shaheen Jabari. Hello, my name is Shaheen, and today I'm going to talk about fair algorithms for learning and allocation problems, and uh, this is joint work with this set of lovely co-authors at the University of Pennsylvania. So first I'm going to start by defining what we mean by an allocation problem. So in an allocation problem, we have an allocator that is allocating a set of scarce resources among several groups that might have different needs for these resources, and uh, we're assuming throughout that the allocations are made at the group level. And the next two slides, I'm going to uh, elaborate on points in this slide a little bit more. So if it's a little bit confusing, it's going to get more clear. Um, so we assume that each group is divided into two parts. Uh, the candidates that the allocator want them to receive the resource and the rest. Uh, we're assuming that there is a fixed distribution over the candidates in each of the group, but the allocator does not know this distribution. Um, and we're assuming that the allocator's goal is to maximize some sort of utility, for example, the expected number of candidates who receive the resource. Um, so let me walk you through two of the examples um, of the setting. The first one is predictive policing. Um, so in this one, the resource to be allocated is the police officers. Uh, the groups are districts in the city, and the candidates for the resource are people who commit the crime. Um, the utility that we consider is the number of discovered criminals but we fully acknowledge that policing can have um, different goals. For example, preventing the crime at the first place, fostering healthy community relations, or overall promoting public safety. But for simplicity and concreteness, and as you see in the experiment, uh, we stick with this utility throughout this talk. Um, the other example is advertising, uh, online advertising. So you can think of a tech company that wants to hire some programmers, and uh, through advertising, on a social media like Facebook. So the resource that the company has is the advertising budget, and the groups can be based on race or gender. And uh, the candidates here are the people who can code, and uh, the utility of the advertiser is actually the number of programmers who see the ad. Um, so recall that I said the allocation is made at the group level. Uh, so we need some sort of mechanism that maps um, group level allocation to individual level allocation. Um, and uh, we consider two models here, and we call these discovery models, and they model different target, uh, different ability for the allocator to target individuals. Uh, so for example, we have um, five units of resource and two groups, and the candidates are in green, and the non-candidates are in blue. So in the random model, each unit of resource that is allocated to a group is gonna randomly reach one of the individuals in the group. And if that individual is a candidate, the allocator will get a resource, uh, re, will get a utility for that, otherwise it doesn't get any utility. Um, so for example, in uh, this example on the left side, the group one, uh, the two units randomly does not reach the single candidate in the group. Uh, as another model for discovery, we have the precision discovery model that was first introduced by Ganchev et al. in 2009 and later used in the paper by Enzyme et al. at 2018. Um, so this says that the number of candidates who will receive the resource is the minimum of the number of candidates that are in the group and the resources that we allocate to the group. So back to our example, now if we assign two units of resource to group one, the only candidate in the group will definitely receive the resource. But if we have more candidates than the resource, uh, then not all the candidates will get the resource. So in the second example, three of the candidates out of uh, five will get the resource and each one of them is equally likely to get the resource. So each of these discovery models basically define a new allocation problem. And uh, what is usually a concern in allocation problem is fairness. Um, so throughout, we use this definition of allocated fairness. 
which is motivated by the general principle of equality of opportunity. And it translates to being this condition, that condition that you are a candidate for the resource. The probability that you receive the resource should not depend on your group. And I emphasize that this is a minimal requirement because it completely ignores the non-candidates in the group. So let's revisit the examples that we had before. So in policing, this definition of fairness implies that if two individuals decide to commit a crime in two different neighborhoods, they should have equal chance of getting discovered. And in the advertising, uh, this definition of fairness implies that um, if there are two programmers from different groups, they should have equal chance of seeing the advertisement through the social network. So the goal here is to maximize utility, but we want to uh, satisfy this notion of allocative fairness. And if it was not clear, the, um, the fairness definition also depends on the discovery models. So the paper is mainly theoretical, but I'm not going to talk about theory much. I'm just going to say uh, quickly that in the paper we show that how we can efficiently compute optimal fair allocation when we know the candidate distribution. And if we don't know that, how can we learn these allocations by interaction uh, with the groups? And the problems here are we have censoring and uh, there can be potential feedback loops. And finally, we study price of fairness, which is um, worst case bounds on how much imposing fairness can, can basically hurt your utility. Um, so for experiments, we were looking at Philadelphia incident crime data set. And uh, this is the reported crimes in 21 districts in the city of Philadelphia from 2006 to 2016. Um, so from these reported crimes, we can aggregate daily crimes in each of the neighborhood and kind of compute uh, candidate distributions in each of the districts. And uh, this is reported crime, but we're kind of using it as a proxy as a total number of committed crime in the city. So you can see on the right side uh, that uh, the, the PDF of these distributions and the red line uh, overlaid is actually um, the best maximum likelihood Poisson fit to the data. So although all of these distributions look to be um, fitted pretty well by the Poisson distribution, they're drastically different because they have very different mean and variance. And for the experiment, we stick to the precision uh, model of discovery. Uh, so I'm just going to show you one plot. So our fairness parameter, uh, which we call alpha, is basically uh, quantifying how much difference in the discovery probability we allow in different um, districts. So the lower the alpha is, the more strict our fairness notion is. On the y-axis, you will see the ratio of uh, the utility of the fair, optimal fair allocation to the utility of the optimal allocation. So a couple of points that I want to point out is generally, as you can see, uh, the cost of imposing fairness seems to not be high in this data set, specifically if you look at uh, the pink, um, for example, the pink curve. So each of these curves uh, is regarded to, one, uh, to different number of resources that are available. So if you look at the pink curve, uh, if we allow alpha to be 0 0.03, so 3% difference, then imposing fairness becomes with no cost. And furthermore, uh, you can see that generally as the number of resources increase, the cost of imposing fairness decrease. Uh, and we also have some experiments about rates of learning, but I'm just going to conclude uh, with uh, highlighting two directions for future uh, work and also like uh, emphasizing on some of the shortcomings of our current model. So the two discovery model that I said, uh, the random and precision model, are kind of like two endpoints of a spectrum. The reality lies somewhere in between. So examining new discovery models is an interesting direction. Uh, the other thing that we kind of ignored was we were throughout assuming that uh, the distribution of the candidates won't change as a result of the allocations that the algorithm made so far. And this, uh, and kind of like understanding these changes and kind of modeling them is another step for future work. And that's it. If you have questions for any of the speakers, the first speaker, Huda, is also available, hopefully available with us on the Slack channel. Um, please uh, go ahead and you can ask questions for uh, specific speakers or more broadly. Hi. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm Debbie Hellman from the University of Virginia. 
And I didn't catch your name, but the one about the food trucks, the, the, um, that's the one I wanted to ask about. And it may be that there's more detail in the paper and I'm just not getting it, but I was confused about which is the notion that's doing the work. And here's what I mean is when you introduce the idea of the, you know, you cut and I'll choose, that to me strikes as, uh, is evocative of a procedural notion of fairness that if you have a fair procedure, whatever pops out of that is fair. So if you and I are splitting the cake and I'm on a diet and I get to cut first, I don't have to cut it in equal shares. I can cut it and leave a little slice for me and you choose first and whatever pops out of that is fair. And you were assuming that, or you were talking as if what was really mattering was the equality of, of the, of the um, cutting, the, you know, the what popped out of it. So I couldn't figure out whether the, the procedural part was doing any work or whether you were insisting on the equal shares. But then it seems like that, that's the notion that's doing the work. And related to that, at the end, when you assume, in theory, inequality, when you have the 30, the, the food bank that's serving 30K uh, and the other one's serving 70K, it seemed that actually equality is the only reason I have 30K uh, chits to play or whatever is because I'm feeding 30K mouths. And I would think that, so, so they are calibrated to the number, the, the, I get one chip per mouth, so to, so to speak. If it weren't, if I had 30K chits, but I have, you know, I don't know, 60,000 mouths to feed, and you have 70K chits, and you have 60,000 mouths to feed, that's really the inequality issue. It seems that you're, that running through the whole thing is the idea that uh, everybody ought to get equal shares, period, end. And I, so I wasn't sure what these other two ideas were doing in it. Right, so uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, the procedure is kind of uh, uh, a tool uh, to uh, intuitively explain the, uh, the notion that we really care about, which is uh, um, this uh, idea of fair share, you know, which has uh, deep roots in, in, in economics and philosophy and so on. Um, so, uh, and the question is, how do you take this very deep notion and apply it when you're, uh, when what you're trying to, to divide is indivisible, okay? So we want some kind of notion of approximate fairness, and this is what we try to, to formalize. Um, and also for these, uh, you know, the food banks with the different, um, uh, pop si different size populations. So let's say, you know, you have some, you're given, you, you have some policy decision of, of the, the, the ratio of entitlements, okay, um, between them. Um, and so this is, this is arguable, but let's say we have that. Then what do we consider to be fair uh, when you have these indivisible, indivisibilities? Um, so this is kind of the novel part. Uh, I agree with you that coming up with uh, uh, you know, these right numbers, that's a, that's a whole different issue which we don't, don't really get into. Yeah, yeah thank you. Well, alternate sides. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, I'm Gina Koblenz, and I'm coming from Yale University. Um, I have a question for Hoda. Okay. Um, uh, is, 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 is Hoda? Oh, okay. I, I'll, uh, oh, she's not listening to, I thought she's listening to the reply ones. Okay. Uh, why don't you try? <laughs> okay. Um, so my question is, are we concerned about, so with the use of luck egalitarianism, are we concerned with reinforcing and even imposing the status quo? So for example, with education, um, you know, if we're relying on the assumption that women have the ability to get less education, um, if we're implementing luck egalitarianism, is that kind of letting us settle into that norm and instead of going back and changing the institution that brought us here? Okay, well, I typed uh, the question for Huda. Maybe I would, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, actually, could, uh, Fernando, do you mind typing that? Okay, we'll get back to that. Uh, we'll give Huda a chance to type, and we'll get back to that, and we'll take a question from this side. Sure, sure. thanks. Uh, uh, Augustin from Colombia. First, uh, thanks to Oda and all of you for a great session. Uh, I had a question for Juba, uh, perhaps a short question. Can you clarify whether the school that is strategic um, in the scenario where there is an SAT 
uh, does the school know the ACT score before and react to that, or is it something that they have to commit before? I was just wondering. wondering we assume they know the SAT and they use that information in the signaling. Oh, that's what explains this counterintuitive. Okay, yeah. got it. Thanks. So, um, it, I wonder if so. You, the institution can um, uh, take a strategic approach and play games uh, in order to force the the school the, the schools the raiders to uh, uh, to change their policy. Like say that they're just uh, going to not accept anybody if the school doesn't obey various things it imposes, like being truthful. Um, have you uh, considered this sort of more game theoretic aspect of when when you start? I mean, game theoretic aspect between the the. Uh, the institution and, and the schools that could force the schools uh, to be more truthful? Um, so, so we haven't really. Uh, what I want to say about this though is we're assuming that the university actually knows what the school is doing in that sense. So, um, which is reasonable. Which, yeah, which is reasonable. You can assume that like the university has seen like what the school has done over the past, yeah, true. So you can, you, can, you can see what the school has been doing over the past 10 years so you can know what kind of signaling they're going to be using. Um, and you know, if they start lying too much, you can punish them for doing this. If they start saying that all of their students have an A, when you see the transcript of a student that has an A, you can just say, well, this A doesn't mean anything, so I'm not going to accept and admit the students. We haven't actually looked, however, at the game theory aspects that you're mentioning. All right, I, uh, I'm Sandy Mason, UGA School of Law. I have a, uh, a, a kind of a deep question for Hoda, which I'll say, okay. and then more specific questions for Shaheen. The question for Hoda, just curious how you and your co-authors would respond to the proposition dessert, individual dessert is utterly irrelevant to most of the predictive tasks that the algorithms we've all been thinking about and discussing are engaged in. How does the effect, how does that proposition, if you agree with it, uh, affect the analysis of fairness metrics? And, and maybe if you don't agree with it, why? And then the more technical questions for Shaheen, I, it's fascinating, I just have a little bit of trouble following as a non-expert when you say the sort of costs of imposing fairness are very small, uh, how are you defining costs? It seemed to me like your measure of fairness was a, a sort of parity in, in true positive rates, the likelihood that a person who actually is committing crime will be identified as such. Does, what does that do to false negative rates? And are those included in how you're measuring costs? Thanks. Yeah, so false negative rate was actually, uh, uh, what we had in the paper, what we do not think about equalizing the false positive rates or like other things. So that's why I was saying that the definition is kind of one-sided. And as for the cost of fairness, you can think about uh, what type of utility you can get when you don't have any fairness concerns and what type of utility you would get when you, import, uh, when you enforce fairness and kind of look at this ratio. So the higher this ratio is, I think in the slides I have the reverse of the ratio. So the closer the ratio is to one, that means that you don't lose that much utility by imposing fairness, which is a very desirable thing to have. But how are you defining utility? Just so to repeat that, so the, the question is how do you define utility? So the utility in this work was the number of candidates who would receive the research. I think we'll have to, I think we'll have to all uh, tune into the Slack channel to uh, hear who this answers, and we have an announcement before lunch. Well, first, let's give a huge round of applause to the team.